Okay, thanks. So pleasure to be back in the airport and on this floor and in this room, and uh, you know, of course, new faces everywhere. But that's the you know passage of time, you know, and uh, yeah. So I'd like to talk today about uh, you know uh, uh, systems which are coarsening. Now, uh, does everybody have an idea? Does anybody have an idea of what coarsening is? No, I'll, I'll tell you. It's, it's the following idea that uh, if you have a situation in which is, you know, if you leave the system long enough, it reaches a steady state. Okay. Now, suppose the steady state is ordered. Steady state could be an equilibrium state, need not be. But suppose there's some, you know, long range order of the, uh, I guess, terms like long range order are familiar to everybody. You know, so that, that anyways, yeah, you will see concrete examples in a minute. But suppose the system is long range ordered in the steady state. However, you take the same system and you put it in a very different sort of initial condition. Let's say the, you know, steady state is the ordered one, let's say low temperature, put it at very high temperatures, it's in equilibrium. Then now you change the environment so that it will try to go to the ordered state that process by which it goes to the ordered state is called coarsening. So coarsening appears as one of the terms there. And uh, that's going to be the central sort of, uh, the, uh, what should I say, scenario of some models that I'll consider. They are coarsening models. Now, uh, forget at the moment about condensates and extremes, we'll, we'll tell you uh, uh, as we go ahead, you know, there's been a lot of interest in extreme value statistics. In other words, if you have a lot of random variables, temperature of, uh, you know, day-to-day -day temperature of something, or, you know, temperature across cities or whatever, for instance, one is often interested in the maximum, let's say, or minimum, but let's say maximum. So that's an example of an extreme value. You know, you have a set of random variables, you choose the largest. The question would be, how are these largest things, if you repeat this again and again and again, how are they distributed? You know, normal random variables, we know if you have a lot of random variables, you know how the sum is distributed, sometimes and often as a Gaussian, you know, normal distribution. But uh, the question is, how are these distributed? So th these distributions are of interest. You know, a lot, lot of people are studying them. So we will be asking what happens to these distributions in a particular context while a system is coarsening. Okay, so on one hand, you have a large system, it's coarsening, and I'll tell you what happens in, in that situation. But while it's doing that, a useful way to characterize what is happening, very, you know, uh, simple and useful, is to follow the extremes. And for a particular reason, we'll find that these models actually show something called condensation, not the ordinary sort of evaporation condensation that we normally think about. We'll tell you in a minute. Anyway, to tell you, uh, well, I won't give the answer away in, in right away, but uh, we'll be following the evolution of these extreme value distributions, these distributions of extreme values during this process and uh, we'll come to a notion you see what happens when you coarsen is that you get regions so you start with a disordered system it's totally disordered but after a long time one hour or something you'll find that there are regions of local order i mean in the end it has to go to a very ordered state over long you know large distances but how can it do that so fast it can't. So it does it in stages. It goes to something. That something grows in time. Okay, so that's very sensible, and indeed that's what happens. Of course, I'll show you some pictures. I mean, you know, but 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 I thought I'll tell you where we're going. Now that imagine that droplet or something that's growing. It's become this big, then that. You know, eventually it will be become as large as the system, roughly. And okay. 
So you might think that if this droplet or whatever is very large, you know, how large? I mean, very large. Let's say the system is very, very big. Let's say the system is infinitely big. We are not, well, not infinitely. I mean, very large, very, very large. Now we were talking about very large, not very, very. Very, very is the system. No, no, really. And very is the time you're looking at. So you have this large region, you know, in which, in which order has set it. One would imagine, and this is the conventional wisdom, that that order is like the order that sets it in steady state finally. You know, what's the difference between this big, you know, provided it is big, and that big, you know. Okay, one thing is the size, but in the middle of that region, shouldn't you be expecting to see something like the very large final steady state as it's called? So this is the conventional wisdom. And uh, what we're gonna show is that in this class of models, this is conventional wisdom breaks down. This does not happen. You do reach some sort of local, let me call it steady state. That's what I put in, in uh, inverted commas. This is a local steady state, not, not real steady state while it's worsening. Yes. Yes. Hi, can, can the question be asked uh, louder or, or with a mic? Because I am unfortunately on the Zoom okay, okay. and uh, I was not able to catch the question. Can you hear now? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if there is a conservation law, uh, huh. then one might imagine that uh, the only way the doctor grows is by some current being driven into it or doctor. Correct. And in the actual steady state, when the droplet is the whole system, right. there is no current. So right. in that sense, uh, the big droplet, but not the very big big school system, would be different uh, if there is a conservation law. So my question is, is conservation more important in the Um. Yeah, conservation law is a little bit important. I mean, but it's it's not the distinction is between conserved dynamics and non. Oh yes, of course. I mean that's reflected in many things. For one thing, in uh, yeah, well, uh, it, certainly the models I'm looking at are models with conserved dynamics, but there are many models with conserved dynamics for which they don't have this. So it, indeed, it does have something with currents flowing and so on and so forth. We'll see. And it, it, it's related to it and therefore also to a conservation law, I think, because if you don't have a conservation law, it's very difficult to imagine, you know, uh, not being local states. Yes. So it is indeed related. Yes, sir. Right, right. No, so so actually, no, no, that's an interesting point. And I don't know, you know, so, you know, if you take Ising model and so on and so on, and you pick out largest clusters and so on. So I don't really know what happens there. Now, in this case, although I'm looking at extreme values, I mean, extreme values end up with just a simple tool you need not have. Extreme value statistics is the natural way to look at the order parameter in this system. That is why I'm using it, not because it is extreme, you know, okay. Because the order parameter is like a Bose condensate. I mean, it's a condensate, okay. Okay, so the, you know, I've roughly told you what I'm going to tell you. Okay, so let's proceed. This is the one, right? Yeah, let's see. Ah, so before I forget, the work is done together with two young people, one of whom is right here. Chandrasekhar Ayer from CBS, who spent, uh, I forget how many, about six months, eight months, something like that at uh, Hyderabad, um, doing some master's project or something like that. And uh, Argodas is a postdoc at 
PCRs. Okay, so the two of them have done all the really hard work that goes along with this. Okay. All right, so now, is there any way to adjust the up down here? Yeah, it's giving a lot of the previous slide. Okay, okay, I forgot to do that. This looks like full screen. No, On the top right, there are two bars there. In the meantime, uh, you know, the, you'll see what's up on the slide is exactly what I told you. you. Start with some random initial condition, go to as an ordered steady state as a function of time, and you go, therefore, from a very uncorrelated system, you know, the spin, you know, whatever the variables are, you know, like at infinite temperature, they have nothing, no, no correlations. Ah, good. Oh, thank you. And uh, you're ending up as, with a state with strong correlations. So the question is, how, how does it happen? Now, uh, so what I've shown on these pictures is uh, like a, roughly a traditional view of what is going on in a normal phase ordering system. Namely, you have droplets which get bigger in time as I was saying, and uh, so there's a, the important thing that has been realized is that this length scale is very important, you know, this uh, length scale L of T. So as time passes, there is a growing length scale, which is in the end, uh, you know, just the size of the droplet roughly. And uh, it demarcates, uh, you know, the separations uh, such that within L of T, the correlations are very strong. Outside or between regions, they're weak. And the conventional wisdom, as I said, is that on length scales, much, let's say, you know, I mean, not at the edges, but in the middle of L of T, the state resembles the steady state. Yeah. So I don't know if it's really conventional, but I mean, this is the, you know, this is what I thought before, you know, let's say. So the main results of the talk is that this conventional wisdom breaks down. It doesn't break down in a small way, it really breaks down. In the sense, well, in a sense that I'll make clear. And this is for models of aggregation and fragmentation. I've put two of them up on the blackboard here. Um, and the point is going to be that the order parameter in these models, that there is a phase transition and there's an ordered state, if I look at the standard deviation divided by something called the mean mass of something in the steady state, that ratio goes to zero as system size goes to infinity in the steady state. Okay, so in steady state, in a system of size capital L, we have some order that's average M SS, and you ask for the fluctuations in that order. Standard deviation. I always have to remind myself that's the square root of the variance, right? That is the, uh, 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 you know, it, it's a measure of how much order is it, but the ratio goes to zero as L goes to infinity. How it goes to zero depends on the particular system we'll talk about, but it goes to zero. However, during Poissoning, this is not true. Not What is not true? That the ratio goes to zero. It's order one. So the fluctuations are of the order of the mean while it is causing. So, th so in this sense, this is the distinction. So th that is what I meant by conventionalism breaking down in this model. You know, I, I thought it's always best to put up the answer you know, before we, you know, before the rest of it, so that you know where we are heading. Uh, well, yeah, so, it, 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 by the way, it holds also in, uh, in a version of the model, which is in equilibrium. So, but the more general 
model that I'll talk about. I mean, in, in fact, most, most of today I'll talk about the non-equilibrium case. So it does not have to do with detailed balance or not, or equilibrium or not. This phenomenon is not linked to that. Okay, so let's go. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Within this, only within this, and then of course averaged over. Exactly. I mean, yeah, I mean, the near edges, something different could happen, but this is happening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, 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 they don't. No, no, it, it's not edge down in that sense. Yes. Oh, sorry, I, I, I moved uh, ahead by mistake. But anyway, we can let this be. Yes. Uh huh. Right, right. Yeah, real space for this. Exactly. Uh, and then this fluctuation happening during closing is maybe that is partly. The, in right. fact, the condensate. The, in one in one case. Right, 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 right. Right. No, so it does not. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. No, so you're right. I mean, so there are two classes of models that I discuss, and one of them is precisely what it is, and then the other it's not. Yeah. Right. So, what are the models I'll uh, 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 discuss? The two one is something called the zero range process. This is a well known model in uh, of so-called interacting particle systems uh, introduced by Spitzer long, long ago, 1970. And uh, I'll define the model in a minute. And the other one is a conserved aggregation, it's a conserved mass aggregation model. And it was uh, sort of invented by Supriya Krishnamurti when she was here as a student. And, uh, and Satya, Supriya and I have a paper on it long, long ago. Okay. But let, what are the models? So the models are these two. The first one is, uh, so they're both models of masses, conserved number. So when I say mass, I mean a, a single particle, okay, unit mass. So they are moving around in some way, which I'll tell you. And then when they move, you have a mass here and here, and this moves, it just goes, there's no exclusion. In fact, it's inclusion. This goes and just joins up. So this is coalescence. Okay. Okay. And if you imagine just coalescence happening, of course, you'll end up with a single massive, uh, you know, object, but, but no, but there's also chipping. Chipping means there's fragmentation, but only one particle at a time. Okay. So for instance, here, you have a cluster with four particles. Okay. In this one, uh, what could happen is that a single particle can move off at some rate. I call it U of four because there are four particles. Need not be the same as the rate at which it breaks off from a cluster with three particles. See, in fact, this is why it's called zero range process. There's an effective interaction between particles, but the range of that interaction is zero. It's only the ones on site. You know, so the hopping rates depend on that. Okay. Yeah, it goes to the next set, and if there's something there, it just joins up. Right, exactly. Well, no, no. So, it, so there, are, it's up to you. Right, so this is the asymmetric version of the model. And you could, in fact, uh, think that it tosses a coin and then decides, decides which way to go. Uh, and that's the symmetric version. And that symmetric version obeys detail values. Uh, yeah, that is correct. Yeah, so th this th that describes something that's in equilibrium. This does not, but we'll deal mainly, you know, I'll, today I'll talk only about the asymmetric case. The other model is quite different, you know, in flavor in the sense that 
the clusters themselves move. Here it was one object at a time, chipping and combining and so on. But here the clusters are allowed to move as well. Um, so there, there is chipping, there is a movement, but the movement is each cluster moves with some diffusion constant d independent of the mass of the rest. No, right, exactly. You can ask what happens if they do, and there's an answer to that, but that's not uh, going to be germane to today's talk. Actually, it's germane, but I'm not going to talk about it. Right. Uh, yeah, W is like a chipping rate, and D is the whole thing moving. It's, it's a diffusion rate, the whole object, the whole cluster, whether it's small or big. So if you have a single particle, also it can move. But if you have ten particles, they can also move with the same. Yeah, 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 yeah. So in mass space, you see what's happening here is that you know you're going up, cascading upward. But then the chipping, putting things back at well, small. I mean, in principle, there could be many empty sites. In fact, there are in these models, there are lots of empty sites, 70 percent, right? I mean, some 80 percent, 80, 80, 80 percent. So it's empty. And so you often just fall at an empty site, and you so it's like a balance in that way. So these two combine to give you etc. Et right. Yeah, there was somebody else. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. No, no, if you take different D, the problem changes much. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it is, um, if you like, uh, a feature of a model which is interesting. And the most interesting case is, in fact, this. The reason we came to this is because Supriya was actually studying a completely different problem. She was studying the evolution interface dynamics of the TOOM interface, T W O M. You all know TOOM. Russian mathematician, you don't. No, it is not very well known, but should be. I mean, and uh, so there's an interface in the two model, and you know, the question was how it evolves. And there's an exact mapping between that interface model and this. So that is why we were led to this. At that time, it just seemed like a nice model to put in this language because you can think about it, you know, things moving as opposed to interfaces. So this is the real reason why uh, we, if you ask what happens when d of m d depends on m then of course it depends on how d depends on it and if it depends let's say as an inverse power one over m is very natural um, you lose the strict uh, phase transition that happens in the model in this case okay so the, yeah Yes, the chipping is the same. Yeah, and in ZRP, it's only chipping. Here, it's chipping plus this move. But the difference is that in the ZRP, the chipping rate depends on the mass. And here, it does not. Neither the chipping rate nor the diffusion constant depends on the mass. Yeah. In steady state. Of course. Yeah. No, well, no, no, no. Yeah. So, so let, I mean, since you're asking, let me uh, tell you if you ask for the probability that a certain site has a mass M, okay, so it turns out there's a phase transition. Uh, Okay, let me, you can think of the phase transition in two ways as you vary W by D or with fixed W by D to vary the density. Let's think of the, okay, I guess to be fair, no, so let's think of the second way. So fix W, we fix D and we're varying the density. If we're very low density, then you won't, Form very big aggregates because things keep chipping, chipping. You know, and so the distribution is simply, you know, something falls exponentially. This is log. 
Mm -hmm. Oh, it's there. So, Thank you. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, I see. Yeah. So there it is. Now uh, you keep changing the density. There's a sharp phase transition at rho c. The rho c is actually okay. I haven't put it on this slide, but it's known uh, uh, what it is. It's square root. Of, uh, uh, let me not. Uh, we'll, we'll come to it. Where this gets broader and broader, it actually becomes a power law. The power is minus five by two for this. I mean, so there's a power law. I mean, it's cut off because we have a finite system. Okay, so this is rho c. Now you keep adding more particles. Nothing happens. This stays the same. Yeah, but how can it be? Because this holds a certain number of particles. Well, so it one condensate. That's the answer. What happens is that this a site you can't predict where at that moment where an infinite num infinite meaning a finite fraction of all particles all the ones beyond rho c are dumped there yeah so so this is the answer so it's not very narrow it's a broad power law distribution yeah. absolutely um, yeah, so the powers are indeed different in the ZRP. They will depend on, in some way, on the hopping rate in general. Okay. And uh, yes, so, so that is a difference. But broadly speaking, it's very similar. Yeah, 5 by 2 is different. I mean, it, 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 that exponent depends on the hopping rate, how I'm going to specify the hopping rate. Okay, so, well, okay, we'll, we'll come to it. No, but I mean, just think about it. I mean, you know, rough description is what? There's a condensate. In one case, it's moving. In the other case, it's not. ZRP is not moving as such. Um, and there's a critical fluid around it. That's all. Okay, so, okay, right. So in that sense, it's not very different, but actually the powers are different. And I, yeah. okay, so right. All right, so here is uh, the zero range process. I mean, you can define it through a master equation and the full configuration space and so on and so forth. And I've repeated the moves, which we need not uh, read. You can just look at the picture. But there's a very nice representation of this model in one dimension. By the way, what I'm talking about today is not restricted finally to one dimension. It's also true in two dimensions. We think we have some evidence for that. But uh, let's, I mean, today's talk will be one day. So the very nice uh, equivalent so-called traffic representation of the ZRP. How do you get it? You, you just do the following. You have a lattice, right? And so these are sites here. So you just lay these down. You know, so uh, wherever you had nothing, you still have nothing, and then you have a, all these four guys laid down. Stretch, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the lattice will expand, you know. But uh, okay, so in that language, actually, it turns out to be more convenient to put empty sites where the masters were, okay. And uh, then you can make a nice uh, correspondence from here to this so-called traffic model in which the cars, if you like, are moving ahead, but with rates that depend on the headway. How many empty sites there? Which itself is a reasonable thing, right? I mean, when you drive, <laughs> okay, <laughs> right? That's right. It's actually amazing how good these lattice models of traffic are. I mean, one would think, you know, you can't base real traffic on this, but they do. Germany, I'm told, near Essen, uh, but that's, uh, I'm, I'm diverting, so I won't. I won't. Uh, <laughs> this is the old work of Nagel and Schreckenberg. And uh, very nice, I'm, I'm sorry to be pointing only at you, but all of you, right? <laughs> I mean, I don't want to divert. 
I mean, if people want to know, you know. No, no, yeah, if there's time, the data which I'm going on. Yeah. Okay, okay, ask later. It's very interesting because it shows how people think later, I'll tell you. Yeah. You know, so there's some sociology there. Okay. So this part is sort of standard uh, uh, results about the steady state of the zero range process. First of all, it can be found exactly. Spitzer, when he defined the model, also pointed out you can you know, find the steady state. It's basically a pro almost a product measure state, meaning that uh, different sites are uncorrelated. Uh, how do you prove that? It's simple to prove, but I won't prove it now. And what is key, of course, in the whole thing is these rates, U. So if U of K with K particles uh, depends on K in this way, one plus B by K, B is a constant, value of B is all important, then, you know, from the structure of the steady state, in other words, to this product measure form, this F is like the weight of having a certain mass at a certain site, but that depends not only on the rate, rate for M, but all the lower M is also. So here it is, it is uh, decreasing. This is a constant, it's decreasing in some way. But it's not becoming zero. K is the number of particles at that side, K. However, yeah, okay, U, U of K is important because that's the rate, but that determines this sort of more central quantity in the theory F, which is a product of all the inverse UKs up to that. It's like multiplying, you know, if, you're fine, if you want to make an estimate of how long will it take to empty out a site, you have to empty this and that and that and that, or something like that. So it, that is the uh, in, rough intuition that I, at least I, I, my, my justification for why, why the product appears. Uh, you know, you, you can choose uh, something less than two also, nothing wrong with that. But th there's a big distinction between B less than two and B, big, big, B bigger than two. For B less than two, you can, uh, there is no condensation. In other words, see, in addition to all this, there's a fugacity which will appear in the weights of this. Okay. Now, as you change the fugacity, there is perhaps and perhaps not a critical value of the fugacity such that there's a phase transition. In the case that B is less than two, there is no such fugacity. It's like exactly like in our ideal Bose gas, you know, uh, so in 2D or smaller, you have rho versus Z and it just goes, I mean, for any rho, you can always find a Z such that you can satisfy the usual equations. The same thing here, it's exactly the same mechanics of how it happens. But for B bigger than two, you cannot. In other words, for B larger than two, there is a critical value of the fugacity, namely one again, as in, so, so at Z equal to one, I mean, um, so the rho versus z curve, actually, there's an intercept. And uh, the rest, just as in Bose-Einstein Bose condensation, there's a dumping of everything into a momentum zero state. Here, it's in real space. So this is a real space condensation. Yeah. You were making that analogy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Uh, I don't think so. No. I mean, certainly this is true. What I've said is true in all is true in all dimensions. It has nothing to do with the dimension. 
it's just there right yes ah. yeah so what will happen is it depending on alpha if alpha is not one on one side you'll always have a condensate on the other side you'll never have a condensate i'll have to think very hard to find out which <laughs> but <laughs> homework right right exactly so the interesting case for me is that there is a phase transition so we are going to work with by the way there's a very nice article uh, on the zero range process you know applications and this and that and also very simply worked out by evans martin evans and those of you who were here when he visited he actually did many of these things this was before he wrote the article so i think he acknowledges the but i don't, I don't does he oh my <laughs> sorry okay yeah 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 but he's very fond of it no he keeps reminiscing about it <laughs> right. i think he liked it i mean he's that sort of guy you know he's of edinburgh cloud not <laughs> not not mediterranean windows let's say okay. no, no. <laughs> don't quote me oh this is being recorded <laughs> right no but he, he no i mean he gave an excellent series of lectures yeah 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 so uh, on zero range process and other things also i think yeah yeah i don't remember now but uh, but uh, highly recommend it yeah anyway so let me move on uh okay so i've uh, already told, told you all enough about this model i won't tell you further let me just remark very briefly that you know when we first considered the model we solved it within uh, a mean field theory meaning we assumed product measure of the you know in other words, if you had two masses here and there we assumed uh, the probability of the you know this configuration was pm1 times pm2 which is uh, and then we derived the phase boundary and so on uh, so of course and the power and all that was based on this uh, analysis turns out much of it was actually correct we didn't know so later rajesh and satya have proved that the phase boundary is actually correct it's not only in one dimension in all dimensions second they also proved that the power I, I think they have proved that the power is also right. So it is five by two. Okay. So you can't solve the exactly. no, you can't solve the problem exactly. Nobody knows the full measure. But the two statements that I made can be proved. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I don't think that uh, has been thought about. Actually, I, at least I have not thought about it. Yeah. Um, I can't remember very well, but I think they proved that the joint probability P of M1, M2 is in fact PM1, PM2, but the state is not product measure. I mean, product measure implies this is not, not the reverse. So it's a, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think so. I mean, I'm subject to correction. Yeah. Usually, yes. Yeah, but uh, yeah, yeah, but two is, you know, there's one, two, three, infinity. You know, it has this, so, right? Yeah, yeah. No, it, it was really quite uh, weird. um yes 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 uh, in other words if you analyze at least within the mean field theory you know the the whole thing and you calculate rho uh, yes well yes yeah yeah i mean uh, the uh, mathematics is very similar i mean of course it's different because it's different but i mean the phenomenon of condensation is due to a similar 
mathematical point. Yeah, it's very similar. Yeah. Actually, it took us a little time to you know, realize there's a condensation. I mean, we kept searching for the missing mass. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? I mean, then one day it struck us that maybe it's like Bosa. And then we did simulations, and there it was. Right? Yeah. Anyway, so uh, let, let's move on. Okay, now uh, time. Uh, tell me the uh, time I should stop. 12 o'clock or earlier? Oh, okay. I mean, you're very generous. <laughs> okay. So let's uh, move ahead. So here's a quick uh, review. So we're now making a break. So you know enough about condensation models. We now go to extreme instances. Yes, sure. Well, the solution shows there is one, I think. Well, yeah, I mean, this is, it's the usual thing. I mean, so we're talking, first of all, we're talking about steady state, right? Otherwise, there are many. So, but in steady state, is there only one condensate always? You can ask. It depends on what you mean by always. You know, so if your system is very large, there is a, let's talk about zero range process. So there is a, time scale for the condensate to form with, with which we are very interested and so on. But there's also a time scale for the condensate to survive. After all, there is Poincare or something somewhere, but these things are quicker than exponential. But so you can ask the condensate, you know, if you have a smallish system, it will not be stationary for all time. So in fact, it, it uh, reappears. I mean, if you watch, somewhere else. Now, in the meantime, while, you know, how does that process? So you may have two. More robust is the amount in the critical fluid. It's always about process. Then the cells in the percolate will be exactly one Right, right. Yeah. Nice yeah, 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 yeah. So I think the answer is that with probability one, there is one infinite cluster. Oh. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Because this um, process that I described uh, will take some time, but that, that's a very short time compared to its residence time. So it's like an, an Isaac model, all up can go to all down. So transit time is large, but much smaller than the residence time of one place. Right. So to that extent, it is true that with probability one, but I don't know whether it's been, you know, I don't know how to prove it. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, so the order for me is going to be the mass of the condensate. Like, right. Uh, does that make sense? I mean, you have a condensation. How many particles are in the condensate? That I'm going to treat as an order parameter. I'm going to think of it as an order parameter. Think of any word? Yeah. Now, now here the uh, if you like, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. 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 So the picture is different. Yeah. It's not the conventional costing. If you really very fond of convention and you want to make it go to the traffic version then you have it traffic version then it is then it is yes yes that's right because these masses are becoming exactly and they are coarsening in the sense of in, in, yeah hmm. 
right yeah 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 absolutely right I didn't follow everything, but maybe we'll move on. You know? <laughs> right. No, I mean, uh, yeah. So uh, let's come to the tool. The tool is extreme value statistics. Okay. So what what does it mean? So here's a bunch of random variables, of, you know, heights, and mean we are familiar with, and maximum is equally easy to imagine. The important thing is, of course, that the variables which we are depicting here without Saying what they are, may be uncorrelated or may be correlated. And depending on whether they're uncorrelated or correlated, the answers for the distributions of the maximum, let's say, are very different. So there's a lot of very nice results for the uncorrelated case. So let me quickly run through them. This is now quite standard and uh, you know, uh, well known. So let me, I, I won't spend too much time on it. Oh, it's not moving. Oh, I'm pressing the wrong thing, I'm sure. Yeah. Right. So it's very, when you have independent variables, it's very easy to formulate how to find the probability of uh, the maximum. You ask for the probability that the maximum is smaller than some x and you can sort of figure out that that's the answer. Now, the interesting thing is that there's a form of universality in the answer for the distribution because, uh, well, in the sense that uh, depending, uh, yeah, I need this, yeah. Depending on the tail of the distribution, you have a parent distribution, you know, depending on whether the tail is cut off or whether it decays as a power or decays faster than a power, there is a form of the extreme value distribution, which is independent of anything else. It sort of reminds you of central limit theorem and Levy distribution, sort of, but not, not quite the same. And uh, so there are three types of answers, Fresche, Gumbel, or Weibel, depending on, you know, Fresche is when you have a broad power law distribution, Gumbel when it's leaking exponentially or as a Gaussian or something and viable when it's cut off. Okay, so I, I won't uh, spend more time on this. I'll just show you the shapes of the distributions 
such as they are, and uh, their forms are known. Very important in all this are these, uh, you know, you may have to, uh, how, how should I say it? Where is Z defined? I'm, I'm sorry, I probably defined it on the pre pre previous slide, that the distribution capital Q is universal, but so there's a shift. Yeah, there's a shift and there's something that determines the spread. Okay, so how, you know, that those features depend on your parent distribution. Okay, but let me just say that and move on. Okay. But when you come to things that are correlated, of course the answers are going to be different. And they'll be different from case to case depending on the sort of correlation. In our case, what sort of correlation do we have? Well, I told you product measure, but product measure with product measure, of course, in the thermodynamic limit. For a system with finite capital L, there is the conservation. And that's important enough to change this distribution. Fortunately, this distribution can be calculated exactly for the zero range process. The answer depends on B. For B bigger than three, it's a Gaussian. Between two and three, it depends on the value of B. So there's a very nice paper by, I forget the order of the authors, Satya Majumdar, Martin Evans, and Royce J. Shia. So where they actually calculate this. It's, it, I mean, uh, yeah, the many things that uh, they, they need to calculate or you know, set out to calculate, and they can actually calculate each. And finally, this is the answer. So I'm just quoting the answer. Uh, so usually yeah, so this is in the, the result we wanted to, and the, the question we wanted to ask, how do you go from, let's say, Gumbel or whatever, you know, one of these uncorrelated, to this? when you're costing. This was the question. This is the question. How does the distribution change? As you go, as, as you cost. Yeah. Okay, probably yes, but not to me. I don't know. But not in the not in I, 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 I just don't know. Actually, I must say, I didn't know much about extreme values distributions till we started on this. But... Uh -huh. Back to the uncorrelated. Yeah, yeah. So th this is precisely what would apply in our coarsening scenario. There are blocks of size L of T, and then you can't say they're not correlated. I mean, they're weakly correlated. Uh, no, no, no. This is for a very specific. Uh, this depends on B. And, the form. and no, there's no, the form is specified. One yeah. plus B by, it. yeah, it depends on the form. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. Yeah, no, uh, so. I suspect one can say something, but I don't know. I mean, you know, so I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah. So this paper is all about, all about just this one plus B by N. Yeah, but I mean, there's so many steps in the whole thing that there must be some things that one can take over. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, so you can see this Gaussian and Okay, for the conserved mass aggregation model, we don't know of any exact result for the P. So here are the results of simulations for three sizes, three or four, three sizes, capital L. And you can see there's a very nice scaling collapse uh, 
provided you have some strange power, which is about 0.7, in some other determinations, 0.75. We won't argue over the power, but there seems to be, in fact, exactly this form, but with a different uh, power. So now this power is very important. So just uh, pay one minute attention to this. L to the delta is telling you the width of the distribution. That's all, it. standard deviation. Delta is half in the case that we're going to look at in ZRP. Here it's larger, but it's still less than one. So you remember I took the ratio sigma over the mean. The mean will be order L and the ratio will go to zero. Okay, so we'll, let's proceed. So this is in, in fact the question we're asking now. You know, starting with an initial random distribution, in which case the masses are actually distributed as per the Gumbel form, you know, just random placement. You're heading towards these quite different correlated distributions. And the, our question is, how does it happen? What happens on the way? Okay. Right. So, okay. The first and, you know, first question is not, so we are really interested in the distributions, but anyway, let's ask what happens. The first thing is that, as you might expect, we form mini condensates. This is at a certain time, 100, 500, 2,500. And what is happening is that you are getting coarsening. Fewer condensates holding more particles. So this is uh, the first thing that happens. Second thing that happens, which happens, I forgot to mention, this is a very important thing generally in coarsening, that if you look at the two point correlation function, that is a scaling function of the separation. So G of R and T is actually a function really of G of R divided by L of T. So this L of T sets a scale. If you measure R in terms of L of T, there's a universal function, a universal meaning invariant function. Same thing happens here. Here it's a mass mass correlation function, not just occupancy, it's a mass mass correlation and uh, defined in the normal way. And it, so this is un, uh, un, I mean, this is just the un, uncollapsed data and uh, with scaling R over L of T, there is a fairly good collapse, I mean. Notice that these correlations are negative. Homework problem. Try to figure out why. It'll take about five, six minutes. May, I, I don't know, maybe five, six seconds. But uh, why should they be negative? Okay, hint. I mean, when do you have negative correlation? Remember, I'm subtracting rho squared. Huh? Sorry? Well, it's, no, but we have masses almost everywhere. But we're subtracting rho squared. So we're asking, is the mass larger than or smaller than rho? So at, at these mini condensates, it's much, much larger. And ma at many others, it's smaller. But that many smaller doesn't compensate for this thing. So just work it out. It's a simple exercise. And you'll see it's negative. So, but OK, negative is easy to see. But scaling is not obvious. You know, who knows? But it holds. So that, that's good. And the, the next thing we wanted to do is uh, really ask about what happens to these extreme value distributions as we go ahead. So, so, so we, we did investigate that. So this is a very bad drawing, but, uh, of, but I'm just trying to show you. So there are these blocks of L of T. In somebody's language, they're weakly correlated. Okay, almost uncorrelated. And uh, these are L of T, they grow with time. They grow as T to the one third in the symmetric, uh, not what am I saying, symmetric, you know, for a certain set of people, when you say symmetric, they will immediately say exclusion process. I mean, like me, I'm, I'm one of them. So symmetric zero range process. But uh, T to the half when it's asymmetric, these results were, uh, you know, are there in Goodrush's paper and also in a very nice paper which I've forgotten 
well, uh, to put down by Brusinski, uh, Schultz, and Spoon in some order. Brusinski is first, I think. So, uh, okay. Whereas in the um, CMEM, this other model, L of T seems to grow like T to the half, which is very understandable because you have diffusion. You know, things are diffusing. Okay. Yes. Uh, for the asymmetric, it's a half. Would you put it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Asymmetric is half. That's right. Oh, I see. Uh, uh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One is uh, one is slower, one is faster here. Yeah. Indeed, this is the way it is. Yeah. Right. I mean, there are simple ways to argue about this, which one can find in that Evans review, and you know. But uh, there's also a more recent paper by a mathematician who proves this. Can you remind me of the name? I'm sorry. You sent me the paper. But okay, he's also forgotten. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I haven't read that one yet. So I have a suspicion that these uh, may be provable. I, I don't know since uh, you know, more rigorous types have looked at. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Right. So let's just review. This is what is happening. So across bins, there are weak correlations. And of course, within each bin, you have a maximum that I've shown in red. But the maximum of all the maxima is clearly the maximum of the full system. But since that maximum is, you know, also can be viewed the way I'm saying as the maximum of these maxima, and these maxima are weakly correlated, we expect that that big one will be a gumbel distribution. Gumbel. And you, one can verify that. But with a non standard feature, which is interesting because it leads to some log corrections, that the number of bins, sorry, number of uh, things you're adding up to get the uh, final gumbel, that's the number of boxes. But that depends on time simply because that number is L over LT and it's changing in time. And uh, it went by too fast, but if you had looked at the gumbel form and so on, there are, there's a log N there. That translates into a log time here, which actually we have also tried to pursue, but we will not talk about that end of things. Okay, now what is going on? Within bins, there are strong correlations and we are ask, we were going to ask about the distribution within bits. Now, if we go along the conventional uh, wisdom route, we'd say the steady state was Gaussian. So within bins also it should be Gaussian and the variance should be of order L of T. But this is wrong. I'm just saying, I'm just trying to set it up. Straw man so that I can, it's non, <laughs> not, not correct. So what actually happens, let's see. So what actually happens, is that there is scaling. From the point of view of uh, costing, it's not at all surprising. You always see scaling. We have to, I have to modify my thing about scaling, in a, which I'll do in a minute. But you see, the point is that if you, the moment you have a scaling function, then it's obvious that the standard deviation will scale with the mean. So you cannot have standard deviation going like L to the half, I mean. Now, you might say, okay, you know, costing difference, steady state difference. There is a problem because L of T will eventually become L. What will happen then? What is going on? Okay, so, so I'm just drawing your attention to this. Okay, now. Um, Agreed. No, but I mean, let's take a value of L, let's say 10,000. Okay. Know, so, so square root of 10,000 is 100. Oh, good. So, <laughs> you know, so steady state, you should have a width of 100. But now you're coming along coarsening. Surely you should hold for L of T being of order L by 10 at least. 
in which case it's a thousand. You know what happened? So something is going wrong. It will, I mean, there must be a big thing to reconcile. It's not a small thing. No, I mean, I, I, right. So here, now I have to qualify a little bit. Look at this curve. Fine, this is scale plot. This part is perfectly scaled. This is the condensate. Yeah, yeah, but this is uh, this is done with capital L very big. Right. Uh, uh, let's say function. Will it actually be a scaling function of uh, L over? Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yes. Yeah. Agreed. So one one should view it that way, but I'm not hundred percent sure that the second one L of T over L. It's yeah. Yeah, yeah. It will. Let me just. Think. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 No, that's a very uh, good and proper thought, and we haven't actually cast it in that form, but it'll be worth doing. We should be able to do it, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So at the moment, I'm taking the point of view that L is a very, very. And uh, so it's at your L over L is close to zero. And that is the one I'm saying contradicts. But but there, it has to it has to join up. Quite right. Yes, 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 which will, yes, including the width, but, but, but remember what will happen, the width is increasing and far beyond steady state and then it will have to come down. So, it, it, maybe it's possible within scaling, I'm not sure. Um, mm -hmm. Because take this 10,000 example, it makes it very clear. Okay, but coming back to the scale, see, this is telling you the largest in your block L of T. Now, let, let's imagine. So it's coarsening, it's stochastic. You don't know for sure if there's a condens even a mini condensate in this block. May not be. In fact, in many blocks, there isn't. All right, just to tell you. But if it isn't, there's still a critical fluid. So you will be fetching the maximum of that critical fluid, which is a fresh air. So that is this part. Actually, you know, and the scaling will be different, you know. So that is why these are not collapsing. If you wanted these to collapse, you have to scale different. But our interest, truth to tell, is the condensate. And that is scaling. And it's scaling, it has a breadth, you know, which is non zero, and there it is. Okay, this is a log log plot, this is not log log, and you can see this happening. Now, same thing happens with the seaman. Okay. This is, of course, different curves as such because, uh, anyway, you can ignore what is written there. But okay, I've uh, tried to say that this is an acute problem because L uh, of T, you know, the scaling of the variance is different. So then what to do? Well, best thing. Let's forget about everything about L of T. Let's just track the variance of the whole thing. So that's this is what happens. So this is the mean of the mass, okay, as a function of time in different system sizes. And this is the variance. It has to reach this value in steady state, but it goes far beyond and then comes down. And goes far beyond and so on. So, this is a, you know, this is the difference. This is the, you know, key difference between, right. Right. So, the overshoot uh, indicates that there are giant fluctuations, giant by the standard of steady state. So, I guess it's translated to be 
How the whole V is curved. Mm -hmm. right. so That's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There will be a scaling. Quite right. Um, yeah. Will. Yeah. yeah. No, no, no. This is the normal. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, yeah. one can make even more like simplistic assumptions, I think, and maybe it will fit in with the scaling form. I, I am not sure. Yeah, probably will. Okay. I mean, there's some master curve which is the non monotonic curve, and these three curves should fall on top of it appropriately. Right, right, right. Um, yeah, so of course the uh, scaling here is L to some power, the scaling here is sort of linear, and but uh, there could be, as you said, two variables, so we can trade one for the other. Right, exactly. That's it. Yeah, no, no, we have checked that. At the end, it is indeed, right, which is predicted. Yeah, so, okay, but uh, fine. But we still want a slightly physical picture of why this happens. Okay, but before that, same thing happens with the CNN. Okay, you see these slight deviations from each other, they're not coincident. Those are traceable to the logs in the, you know, so we can actually, you know, rationalize these differences. And uh, th this is in the means. So the way the means behavior behave in a gumbel are very sensitive to logs, uh, variance less so. So, okay, so things fall in correctly. And, uh, okay, uh, of course, this is not. Uh, uh, That's right. Yes, absolutely. Right. Right. And, yeah, right, exactly, because these are sub, you know, L to the delta or something. Yeah, yeah. So there's a, a nice paper earlier on by uh, Punya Brat Pradhan, Argodas, and the two Chakravartis uh, pointing out, uh, well, so they had looked at the variance and concluded that it goes like L to the sphere. Okay, now, but as, I, as I say, where does this come from? And so here is uh, the answer schematically. I mean, when I say where does it come from, it's a slightly vague question and the answer is equally vague, but, but I think, in, I hope insightful. And uh, the answer is the following. It's different in the two cases. Let's look at this first. This goes back to Kedar's initial observation. CMM, the condensate can move. So if you have this L of T, and the finite fraction of the mass there moving out, that's a huge fluctuation. So you can understand not only, well, the total mass in that L of T will show these large fluctuations. Now, this actually has been studied already in some detail in the steady state as a functional system size by another person who did her PhD here, Himani Sashtra. So what did she study? Well. She was interested in a biology problem, biology. You know, there's an injection of vesicles on one side. And if you know anything about biology, which I did not before I met her, but there are stacks. And the question is how the vesicles go through the stacks. Now, I mean, one would imagine that they always go stack by stack and get processed stack by stack. But no, it actually happens also. That happens, but also it can be that stacks move carrying the vesicles and they merge, which maps exactly by the way you asked me for. Uh, somebody was asking, you know, ah, so this is a, an example of why we have this D model. I mean, it, I shouldn't say why, because this example came many years later, but, uh, <laughs> but, but, but it's actually there. I mean, when the stacks move, uh, they are just, the movement is dominated by the Golgi 
apparatus uh, mass, not the vesicle. So it's in fact independent of. So anyway, never mind. The, what I wanted to say is that this was the reason Himani studied it. And what she studied was uh, the following problem that uh, you have injection of one vesicle at a time, one particle at a time on one side. Then precisely this dynamics that I had chipping. So each, but by the way, each of these moves is very sensible in the biology, the chipping and the uh, movement. I mean, so, so, so let's say the bulk is doing that. And at the end, when you've finished your stats, you come out. But what will come out, what will come out is sometimes a large condensate, sometimes not a large condensate. Whatever comes out, comes out. But then, of course, if you look at the total mass, that shows these huge fluctuations. This is in steady state. And then Himani went on to actually calculate analytically these fluctuations in the limit of zero chip. So th things are merging, 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 and then leaving. So it's a very nice steady state. And the very interesting intermittency properties there, which she sorted out, but we will not get into that. But I just wanted to draw the analogy of this to the condensate in our thing moving in the L of T system, it's going out and pausing large margin. So this, in some sense, one understands. What about zero range process? Nothing is moving. Well, so let's think about, you know, this variance curve. You know, let's just go back for a minute. Oops. Yeah, let, let's, okay, it was actually, yeah, this is the one I want to do. So what, does one think is happening near the peak? Well, so, you know, Grosinski and everybody have studied, I shouldn't use the word coarsening, I should use it very cautiously because they use coarsening in a slightly different way. But I've defined what I mean by coarsening. So let, let me stick to that. Okay. But uh, they point out and that in the approach to steady state, finally, you'll have one condensate, but before that you'll have probably two, or maybe three, two, let's say two. Now imagine this guy here and that guy here, about 50% each. Who's going to win? I don't know. Nobody knows. What will happen? Mass currents are set through the intermediate critical fluid and it goes and eventually one will win. But if you look at the mass of any one as a function of time, that's going to have huge fluctuations. So at the level of two condensates only, sort of obvious. Now, so our picture is that you're starting from disordered state, you're going to the ordered state, but you have to go through this. So it is not this state, but it's that state which is governing what is going on. So there's, it's not always steady state, but pre-asymptotic state, which is governing what is going on. Okay, I'm almost at the end. Oh, and I'm far beyond 12.15. Okay. Sorry. Okay, okay. Hmm. Uh, I was just wondering if you take those parts, uh, you know what non-linear process is ultimately part time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right. Of the peak. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm thinking of a polynomial that I can start more polynomial than part time. Huh. When I, if I know what non-linear process is that is part time. Yeah. Yeah. No, that will work. I mean, it will be capital L to the Z is the time scale, both to reach steady state and to reach the peak. But, you know, I mean, there'll be a constant factor, but uh, that will be the time scale. Yeah. Uh, so that is the time scale over which L of T is of order capital L, which it is when you have three or four condensates. You know, so that, that, that's all I'm saying. Yeah. Right? Okay. All right. So I think I'm at the end. Yeah. Right. So, well, this is in words. Something obvious is said here, but maybe it's better to look at it in terms of clouds. So here you are. You know, so, right. 
So here's the initial state. Here's the possible final state. Do you go along the straight and narrow path and reach that with this determining what happens? The answer is yes. Yes, you do for everything except the condensate. <laughs> right. So, yeah. So if you monitor the number of zeros, the uh, what else? Correlation, something, something about God. Number of ones. Huh? Number of ones. Number of ones. Okay. <laughs> right. Yeah, they're all as in steady state. So this path is not to be scoffed at. It is there. But also there is, at least for the object of our interest, this other path where the fluctuations are very large. Yeah, so in this case, it's a few condensate state. In that case, it's an open system, which is actually governing what is happening. Again, you know what Kedar had guessed in the beginning. And so this is our overall picture. So the interesting thing for us is that not only is it different, but the, it's actually fluctuation dominated. You know, so the, uh, there has been some work on something called fluctuation dominated phase order. So that has been studied a lot, also for some time, Diviandu and uh, uh, Apurva and others actually studied this. But in all those cases, the steady state was also fluctuation dominated. Here it's not. So this is the difference, you know. So, it, you know, yeah, I mean, certainly when we started the study, we didn't have any inkling of this large fluctuations and all, but, you know, it's coming back. Okay, so I'll stop now. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.